Hey, Crate Diggers, it's me, Makila Sunrise, and today I am reviewing Prince's Piano and a Microphone 1983, next on Vinyl Jeopardy. Well, as promised, I am going to tell you what I thought of the Piano and a Microphone uh, album from Prince 1983. I did not put the needle down on it because my needle is really kind of cruddy and I didn't want to mess up the album, but I did listen to the CD, so I went through, listened to all of the songs, so I'll tell you what I think about it. First, let me tell you that I like the packaging. Uh, for people who are Prince fans and collectors, uh, the packaging of this album set, this, this uh, limited edition, is really nice. This is a very sturdy case that it came in with the um, CD holder there and the picture there of Prince. And then it has this sleeve where the record uh, is held and it is very uh, very nice for a collector's album and then it also has in it the booklet that has the writings of people who were there at the time of the recording and so it has in here uh, some writings here by Don Bass I like this particular picture. It's a really good picture. The picture that's on the cover, I'm not that impressed with. Uh, I keep thinking and hoping that it's my bad eyesight, but it looks fuzzy to me, and I don't, I don't like that. But um, Don Batts talks about the recording of this cassette tape, uh, where Prince basically is just monkeying around and figuring out what he wants to do and how he wants to do it. He just kind of plays the piano and plays um, and sings um, just kind of freestyle, trying to figure things out. And he just kind of tinkers around uh, on the album. But also on here um, is some writing by Lisa Coleman. And of course, she was around at the time. And she talks about basically how... Uh, Prince is going through the process of um, writing songs at the time at the piano and she kind of describes what he may have looked like, his rocking, his stomping on the floor, um, and the groove that he was in at the time. And uh, she does a pretty good job of explaining probably what the vibe was like in the room at the time, even though he was the only person there. But I'm sure she could well imagine based on having seen him um, play the piano and um, uh, go through his creative process of tinkering out a song, kind of working working it until the song becomes something and that's basically what uh, happens then uh, there's this picture here and there is uh, the memories and musings here written by Jill Jones and she talks about basically how she uh, met Prince and I thought it was very interesting she starts out talking about how she had a run-in with Vanity um, and Susanna Melboyne has a similar story of a little run-in with Vanity. It seemed that at the time Prince was very non-exclusive with women and it seemed that Vanity was the only one that didn't get that message. It seemed that she was a little territorial about the man, whereas uh, he had other interests. Anyway, uh, she talks about some of the songs and what she remembers of what was happening in particular Wednesday, which um, apparently is a song that has been out on bootleg for a while. Uh, I had never heard it before, but um, it was supposed to be a song that was featured in Purple Rain and it got cut. Um, and she talks about how much, of course, he loved The Case of You and she talks about how uh, the song Why the Butterflies 
that that song uh, is about her um, sexual experience with him. Um, and so now let me go through each one of the songs and tell you what I thought. First, let me say that although I was very excited to hear Prince playing and play, playing the piano and uh, singing, he of course sounds fantastic. Um, I wasn't all that excited about the era. It's one of my little pet peeves having been a Prince fan for a long time and I'm not the only one. There are a lot of Prince fans who have this pet peeve that uh, everything that is featured or comes out about him revolves around Purple Rain and that Purple Rain era when the man had has done so much music. He's composed so much music. He's written so much. He He's put out so many studio albums, 42, 45, whatever it is, yet that one album, even when that one album always gets all of the shine, uh, it's a great album, but, you know, I could probably, personally, I could do another 10 years without ever hearing Purple Rain and I'd be fine with that. Um, it's just not one of my favorite albums. Um but he's done so much great work and even when they do like video features um on television of his his life and they show pictures and maybe they'll do a montage and maybe they'll do 25 pictures and 10 of them will be from purple rain and it's just like man 40 years in the music business and the only pe thing that people want to acknowledge is purple rain and that's was a little bit of my bias going into listening to it because I knew it was from the Purple Rain era. And so, eh. But uh, it turned out that I liked it a lot. I liked um, the rawness of it. I love that it was just him and the piano. And um, he went all over the place with his voice. Uh, he experimented with a whole lot of different things. He experimented um, on the piano. Um, it was it was spectacular. Um, I actually did like it. And like a lot of Prince albums, for me, it had to grow on me. So uh, let's start with the medley at the beginning, 17 Days, which is probably the only... Well, Mary Don't You Weep is probably the only full song let me let you know that each one of the songs are pretty short um they're not uh full length songs so 17 days is it seems that he puts his all into it um he is using his body percussively in this uh song and he pretty much goes through the whole lyrics of the whole song and it it's uh it's a dance tune with him playing it on piano which is you know that's phenomenal in itself then there is a snippet of purple rain and the music is not what you would typically associate with purple rain um so you know maybe that's just a, a marketing thing and you know he he sung some of the lyrics to Purple Rain, and I mean, it is super short, maybe 40 seconds or so uh, of Purple Rain. So uh, they have it on here as one of the songs in A Case of You, which he sung a lot in concert. He really loved Joni Mitchell. Uh, when he was definitely a fan of Joni Mitchell and her music, her artistry. So uh, it's a beautiful rendition of A Case of You and uh, still not the whole song. Uh, then there is Mary Don't You Weep, which kind of uh, goes into Strange Relationship and has some of the lyrics of Strange Relationship uh, in it. And it's it's also pretty um gospel-y as well as jazzy and bluesy he's kind of doing a boogie woogie kind of thing with it and um it it is also kind of somber um kind of hard to describe it's it's a traditional mary don't you weep 
kind of gospel spiritual, but it also has a, a love lost story in there as well, which is a little unusual and it kind of goes into strange relationship. Yeah, he uses some of the lyrics from strange relationship and uh, strange relationship is a, a song that he's played piano uh, in concert before. Um, and I thought that it was, it was good. It wasn't particularly spectacular or anything, but it was good. Then he does International Lover and does something that he has been known to do before. And that is uh, play the music to one song and the lyrics to another. So there's a little bit of Doomy Baby in that. And I love do me baby that is like one of the songs that changed my life as far well my purple life it is the song that made me really listen to prince music because before then i was a kid who was just in love with prince he's so cute but do me baby was one of the well, it was the first song that I actually listened to the music. So it was a real treat for me uh, to hear him playing that particular song. And then there's Wednesday, which is another very somber, sad song. This is the song that was going to be sung by Jill Jones in Purple Rain. Then after that, um, there is Cold Coffee and Cocaine, hilarious. This is a song that he is using his alter ego, Jamie Starr voice, um, the whole Jamie Starr attitude. If you don't know who Jamie Starr is, um, Google it. Now, I'll tell you a little bit. Uh, Jamie Starr is one of Prince's alter egos, and he kind of uh, is somewhere between um, a dirty old man and a pimp. Somewhere in between there is uh, Jamie Starr. And uh, it is hilarious, and there's a, a Jamie Starr voice that we that we know of. Then there is Why the Butterflies, and the piano on this is gorgeous. Um, same thing on Wednesday. The piano is really gorgeous. Um, but Why the Butterflies, I didn't particularly like the lyrics or the lack thereof. There really w wasn't much there. But um, the piano uh, on Why the Butterflies is gorgeous. So um, this is something that I will listen to again and again. It's not just some novelty type of record. It is something with some quality music on it and some stuff that's finger popping and I can listen to in the car while I'm going to different places and uh, it can go into the regular shuffle of uh, Prince music for me. Um, there has been some talk, some speculation from different people about whether or not this album should have been made at all um, because it is unfinished and raw and it was outside of Prince's norm to put out anything that was unfinished, unpolished. Um, and I'm glad that it, that it came out because number one is piano. I love him playing piano, but also um, it kind of gives you some insight into one of his or two or some of his creative process. I'm sure this is not all of his creative process, but it's something that people have always wanted to know. I'm sure there's a lot of musicians who wanted to know how he kind of works through a song to make it into uh, a polished, finished product. And I'm not um, at all offended by that at all. Um, my take on it uh, might be a little different and unpopular um, to a lot of Prince fans and a lot of people. And in particular, 
uh, I think it was yesterday or maybe the day before, Sheila E. was on the show The Talk and she was basically equating these cassette tapes uh, to Prince's personal diary and she seemed to not think that it was a good thing for this particular album to be put out, she said, without his permission. So let me give my unpopular opinion about this because uh, I have not, until this point, given my opinion, but I'm getting a little sick of people with their beliefs about what Prince would have or would not have wanted. So in a nutshell, I think Prince gave up his right to speak from the grave through well-meaning acquaintances, friends, ex-lovers, colleagues, whoever they may be, when he made a decision not to memorialize his wishes legally. So let me expound on that a little bit. As far as I know, there has been no lawyer who has come forward and said, oh yeah, I worked on a trust with Prince in 1998 and we drafted it but didn't quite finish it and this is what Prince really would have wanted. That hasn't happened. Um, I find it hard to believe that a man of means, a smart man, um, would not create a will or a trust or some type of um, document to let people know what he wanted after he died, except he did not want to. And maybe he just didn't care. Nonetheless, that was his choice. He made a choice. I don't think that he was like a 26 year old man who got hit by a bus unexpectedly and now does not have a will. This is a person who had lawyer after lawyer after lawyer after lawyer after lawyer in his life. Who knows how many lawyers he had over the course of a 40 year career in music business. One or two of them probably mentioned to him you know, we should probably do some estate planning. And I just don't believe he said, oh yeah, we'll do it tomorrow. And he just never got to it. He didn't want to. And so he didn't. And because he didn't want to, he chose not to. He does not have a right to speak from the grave through other people who believe that they know what he would have or would not have wanted. Even if they are 100% right and they absolutely do know what he would have wanted or not wanted, he lost that right when he did not memorialize it legally. Therefore, I believe that whatever his family chooses to do, they are 100% right because he didn't say anything else. He didn't tell them what to do. Therefore, whatever they do, it's right. If they decide to light a match and torch Paisley Park because that's what they want to do, they are right because he didn't say what to do. I imagine, however, that they are doing the best that they can with a huge responsibility um, that I would not want to have, but they're doing the best they can, I assume. And even if they did the worst that they could, if they chose to do the worst and just throw it all away, Prince chose not to memorialize it, not to document it legally. And when he made that choice, he lost his right to speak from the grave through the voices of people who I'm sure are very well-meaning. Everybody is entitled to their own opinion, but I really think that a lot of these people are overstepping their bounds 
when they want to criticize what the family is doing um, because they believe that they know what Prince would have or would not have wanted. But he don't get to say nothing. And that's just how I believe the way it is. So, I'm going to enjoy listening to this whether he wanted it or not. Love you, Prince. Peace. What do you think? It's a controversial issue. Put your comments at the bottom. And uh, if you like talking about records and music and music concerts and record collecting, then definitely like, subscribe, and tell me what you think of the channel right below. I'm Akila Sunrise, and this is Vinyl Jeopardy. These are my records. <laughs>